to see which one should take from me. <coughs> okay, can, okay, it's a good, good question. Can our doubt and confusion about things within Islam concerning capital punishment and punishment of the theft and polygamy affect our belief whether Islam can be from divine or not? Okay, this is a simple thing. If we believe, or if someone has good reason to believe in the foundations of the Islamic worldview, namely the Quran, the prophetic traditions, etc., and they reject something that is clear from that tradition, it is philosophically tantamount, equivalent, of rejecting the, the whole tradition itself. Now we have to be honest as human beings. You may not like the fact that in Islam we cut the hand of the thief, for example. Even the Quran mentions, don't let compassion, compassion overtake you. This is the right thing to do from a social perspective. See, so even Allah is saying, I, I know you don't like this. Yeah? But what we have to understand is when we view these things, we shouldn't view them in a Fox News narrative. What is the Fox News narrative? It is basically, you have a sister with a niqab, with a burqa, yeah? And she has a sword, very sharp sword, right down her cloak. And she's waiting, like this. Yeah? You have a guy with a really big beard, up to his navel. And he sees a poor Canadian dude, running into one of the supermarkets, to steal a cookie because he's hungry. He's running, right? He steals the cookie. The guy with the beard sees him and he uses his beard to trip him over. <laughs> and after the sister with the burqa, she's like, yes. She gets the sword and she goes, Allahu Akbar, and cuts his hand. This is the caricature, the cartoon, that has been portrayed by Western media, specifically the Bill O'Reilly show. What an idiot. <laughs> that guy's an idiot. Honestly, Bill O'Reilly, Fox News, these guys have a specific agenda. You can just tell. They have caricatured human beings, right? So the point is, do we view Islam from that perspective or not? Or do we view it from the perspective that our philosophy of crime and punishment is not based on a liberal narrative? based on specific individual freedoms because we consider society to have to have rights as well. We also believe that it's the philosophy of crime punishment in Islam is based upon the deterrent effect, which is in line with Western tradition. We had, for example, Professor Van der Arg from Fordham University. He used to be a proponent of suitably harsh punishments. He used to say things like, whatever deters them, whatever fears the most, deters the most. So you need suitably harsh punishments to deter people from doing something. Also, it's not based on jungle justice. The Prophet وسلم, didn't want anyone to have any punishment on them. He didn't. It full stop. He said, go away. He said, I don't want to do this. But if you gave him all the criteria and all the conditions, then it was a divine right. Because it was part of protecting society. And some of the criteria with regards to thief, you have to be above the age of puberty. You, have, you must have stolen it if it was in a hidden place. Not public place, by the way. In some, according to some scholars. It has to be over like 32 pounds, which is about, what, $50. It has to be done by someone who's not hungry and poor. It has to be done by someone, according to some scholars, who know that you have to know that it's the wrong thing to do. So ignorance is an excuse for certain instances, right? Etc, uh, etc. Et <coughs> also, the, the burdens of proof have to be so high. We don't follow the liberal tradition of beyond reasonable doubt. It's higher than that. It has to be, that's why the Prophet said in a hadith in the Prophet tradition, it's better to release nine guilty people than inflict a punishment on one innocent. And also, the punishments don't sit on their own, they sit on values, that the society has to have certain values. Cohesive values in society. So when you say from a jurisprudential perspective, you see that it's not, that, it's not barbaric anymore. Maybe it's still harsh for your perspective, but it looks like it could work. Do you see the point here? Now think about it, in downtown Toronto, yeah, if you were to have a Lamborghini, you know what Lamborghini is, yeah? <laughs> Without the, the top, right, a convertible, and you leave the cars in and you go to the mosque to pray, you think your car will still be there? They won't only take your car, but they would even steal the tire prints on the road. <laughs> but if you do that, to, do that in Saudi, for example, you could leave your car in there with the engine and say, take me. <laughs> and it won't be taken. So sometimes the audacity of people to say, oh, it's harsh punishment. Look at our society. And the sister was so right about infidelity. According to social statistics, 70% of all marriages are naughty. 70%! 
you can't trust anyone anymore. <laughs> Do you see? So it's so true. So we have to see reality, as the gentleman said, for what it is. This is why, you know, look about, look at, look at Britain. In Britain, there's 160 rapes every day, and that's not a mad, crazy mullah mufti talking. It's Amnesty International UK. 160 rapes every day. According to the same organization, right? Listen to this, it's very profound. 74% of men would call an agency if there was a sick dog on the road. Dog. But only 50% would call if it was a battered woman. I know this reality. This is, you know, we can't portray something fake. Let's talk about reality, as the gentleman said. I used to work for a very senior American company. Northrop Grumman, defense company, yeah? So I left for ethical reasons. Yeah. Um, I was a project manager. I used to work for the police IT organization, big company in England dealing with criminal justice systems. And every single guy in the office used to just treat women as if they were second class citizens. That was the reality. They saw them as an object. And that was just a pure reality. It was it's disgusting. And this is why, you know, we need to speak about reality and how do divine values shape reality? And that's what we need to do. That's why we need these values in place. So when we do look at the punishment system, we have to see it in light of the true philosophy, take all the corpus of material. You can't run away with one verse and run away with the verse and, and escape the whole of all the Islamic values. You see, the, it's like a four-dimensional model. You see it all together in the corpus of material as it is. You see, this is why they say like what? 12 people in 1400 years got their hands cut off? Only 12 people? And most of them, I believe, were from self-testimony. Because they wanted to escape the punishment of the after. Anyway, so I hope that demystifies a little bit Sharia law, Islamic law, and gives it like a very unique different perspective. Any other question? Yes? You'll have to really speak up or come to the front, I can't hear you. Sorry, that's From a secular perspective, the way that I grew up in That's a good point. That's not, I don't know how to answer that question. But that's a good point. No. So I haven't really thought about it much. But on this quick speculative reflection, um, our main duty, I think, as Muslims in the West is to basically follow a prophetic tradition. And the prophetic tradition is, could be found in the Arba'een and Nawawi, the 40 hadith of Nawawi, when the Prophet said, you're not a true believer unless you love for others what you love for yourself. So the question that you should talk to yourself in the mirror and say, what do I love the most? And believe me, it's not going to be your mother. It's not going to be your wife either. Yeah? It's going to be Islam. Because Islam defines who you are, defines your worldview, and it makes you eligible for eternal bliss. If you love that the most, give it to others. And when we say Islam, we say Islam comprehensively. Because in the Quran it says, ummatun." يَدْعُونَ إِلَى الْخَيْرِ وَيَأْمَرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْحَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ وَأُولَٰئِكَ مُنْفِهُونَ Let there rise amongst you a band of people from the Ummah, from the people. That would call to the good. And the good here, according to Ibn Kathir, which is an exegete of Islam, said, it means the whole of Islam comprehensively. They command the good, they forbid the wrong, وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُنْفِهُونَ And they are the ones who attain success. So these are the two things I think we should be doing. It's calling people to our values. Some of them, they're common, some of them are unique. Call people to that. Express yourself as a community. We live, you live in Canada as a mosaic society, right? So you call it. You're so proud to say you're a mosaic society. 
And mosaic society is a what? You you are distinct as a community within a within a bigger community. And if you're distinct, <laughs> then what do you do? <laughs> he has conversations with the brother last night when I was really really tired. I remembered everything he said because he has a much a very nice smile. Oh. <laughs> so uh, basically, if you live in a mosaic community, then you know what makes each other distinct. If that's the case, connect with one another and describe who you are. And it doesn't mean just fasting and praying. It means how do you see the world as a Muslim? For example, why have we not in the West spoken about Islamic economics? I believe as a Muslim that Islamic economics can save the world. That's not idealism. That's even in the mouth of the Prime Minister of Ireland. He said if we had the Islamic economic model, we would not be in the place that we are today. Because Islamic economy, and we shouldn't be shy about this, Islam has solutions for global political situations. There's nothing wrong with that. This is our world view. And this is why we consider Islam as a mercy. It gives us mechanisms to deal with global solutions, values. For instance, with economy, we have a very unique view on economy, which is the distribution of resources, which deals with the number one economic problem. We also see that we have a great geopolitical model. Because your geopolitical model in Islam is based upon distribution rather than competition. Because the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad said, the son of man, son of Adam, the human being, has rights to food, shelter, and clothing. So it gives you, it defines your limited needs. But the capitalist model, the liberal economic model, is there's too many needs, not enough resources. So it creates excessive competition. But we're saying there's limited essential resources, needs, and enough resources. And certain ge geopolitical studies have shown that we could feed 36 billion people on this planet. We've only about 6 billion people on this planet. So we have a, a sound geopolitical view about economics. Also, we we think that interest restricts the imp imp impedes the distribution of wealth. Because if you make people pay interest, then they, ha they have to pay more money. But if there's no interest and there's excess money in the hands of the person, they can't hoard the wealth because it would decrease 2.5% each year. So that's an economic stimulus for them to engage in social, con 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 uh, social contracts and transactions and create entrepreneurship. Also, we don't have much tax, which means more, hands in the hand, more money in the hands of society. So there's a whole in amazing stability. What about economic stability? We don't have this concept of free-floating money. Like your money, right? With the, I don't believe you have the queen on your money still. When are you going to get out of that colonial disaster? You guys are Canadians now, yeah? Look, this is your queen. Oh, there's no queen on this one. Uh-oh. On the 20, that's the one, yeah? On your 20s, you have the queen, right? Now, that money is basically an IOU. I owe you 20 pounds worth of gold or something, yeah, or something substantial. You take it to the bank, you won't get anything. That's the reality of fractional reserve banking. It's a big joke. What happened historically? Everyone used to put the gold in this common, you know, area. Someone would preserve it. They're thinking, well, many people are saving it. They're not spending it. Let me preserve some that the percentage that might take it, and the rest of it I use for myself, invest, and make money for myself. So once you're using other people's money to make money for yourself, essentially, yeah. And that happened so much that when people wanted their money back, or the, basically the bubble burst. So in Islam is different. The money has to be paid on something substantial. It's not free floating, like gold or silver. That's why it makes it more stable. So when there's more money in society, it means there's more wealth. So businesses are not devalued just like in a liberal capitalist model, where if there's more money, it doesn't mean there's more wealth. Do you see? So there's a whole comprehensive view on Islamic economics. And I've just mentioned it in very briefly crude terms. So we should say, look, there's a solution for us. We have economic problems, 25% of America underneath the poverty ladder. How do we deal with the problem? There's no answers. It's just debt, austerity, etc., etc. But if you believe these are divine values and they have worked before, then give them to society. I think that's what we should be doing too. With regards to Egypt and Tunisia and Libya, I don't know what the answer is. I mean, I hope these are genuine revivals. And that's all I could hope and pray for. <coughs> I respect the fatwa recently from Qadawi with regards to Lib the Libyan dictator. I don't. Rem do you remember what the fatwa was? Yeah. If you could shoot him, kill him. <laughs> Come on, the guy's mad, man. He's killed like six to ten thousand people, massacred his own people. He was threatening to poison the water system in Tripoli. Mm -hmm. This guy is wacko jacko. <laughs> he looks like Michael Jackson anyway. <laughs> this guy's crazy. This is why. Um, Beware of the anger of a patient man. 
The Muslims have been very patient in the Muslim world. They've had dictators for years, supported by some Western leaders, I hasten to add. Yeah, the duplicit behavior of Mr. Smiley, Obama. <laughs> yeah, he's Mr. Smiley, isn't he? He's a, he's a smiley face behind a very rotten foreign policy. Yeah? Look what's happening here, Ar Afghanistan, etc. And that's a different story. Mr. Smiley face, who still supported Mubarak until the people were rising even more. They didn't know what to say, where are we going with this, right? So you saw the duplicit behavior, right? And they were giving uh, Egypt 1.4 billion dollars every year anyway. Um, they've done this before, you know, they fund dictators all the time. What about Islam Karim of Uzbekistan? They give them about a billion dollars a year. What does he do? He boils his political opponents to death, injects them with the AIDS virus, removes their fingernails, rapes their mothers and their sisters. Human rights, go to Amnesty International, it's all there. Who funds them? We do, our taxpayers' money in the West. Do we account our governments for that? No, we don't. Should we? Yes, we do. This is the reality. This is the reality. And this is the, this is the result of adopting an ideology based upon benefit. And that's what capitalism does. I'm going to have a relationship with you or you based upon a benefit. If something mutually, if something stronger comes along as a benefit, what am I going to do? I'm going to break that bond now. So we don't have that connection anymore because you're useless. And I don't know, that's a sad reality. I don't know, it probably hasn't answered your question. So I said, uh, it probably won't, but these are my thoughts on it. If you have something, please tell us, yeah? Jazakwa. Yes, a lady at the back. Um, I just wanted to respond to that comment from like a very agnostic Canadian girl. Um, so I was never baptized in my family. Sorry, once again, what comment are you responding to particularly? Oh, the question of what's our responsibility here in the West. Okay, go for it. Um, and what I see happening in the West is that people are trying to make themselves Muslim. Um, and they're trying to make themselves Good, thank you. Yeah, I mean, that's another prime example why Muslims should educate the wider society. I mean, you know, we all have friends that are non-Muslim or come from another tradition. If we have true friendships, then we should like, share what we are. Uh, if we're not, then it's a superficial friendship in my opinion. If I have non-Muslim friends, they know who I am, they know what makes me distinct, I know what makes them distinct, and then you have a bond. If it's going to be superficial, you know what to tell them who you are, then what kind of friendship is that in the first place? You have to really think about that, and that's a very good point, you know. It should, People are asking for knowledge. People are thirsty to know what's going on. You see, I think it's a very, very profound point. Final question. Anyone? Final question? Not that I wanted to be final question, but I've been told there's five minutes left. No, if there's no final question, I'm going to read on from the paper, okay? Okay, good. Um, you, said, you said that outside space and time, there could, logically, there could only be logically one God, not multiple gods. Why can multiple gods not exist, and why is this concept of one God so critical in Islam? 
Very good question. Okay, first and foremost, from a logical, rational perspective, the argument is, how can you claim multiplicity of causes outside of time and space? You don't have anything that allows you to do that. There's nothing that allows you to, to discuss multiplicity. For example, if I had two dots on this board, you know there's two dots because of space, shape, form, color, size. These concepts exist within time and space. Outside of that, how can we claim something is more than one? How can you have two things that are not contingent in time and space? Where is the differenti differentiation between the first one and the second one? Or number one and number two? There's no di you can't even claim it, do you see? So it would be irrational to do that outside of time and space. Also, as we said, Occam's razor is a philosophical principle that you can't multiply entities beyond necessity. If you say there's two, then it creates more questions than you answer. So the best explanation is always the simplest explanation from the philosophy of science or philosophy in general. Also, the oneness of God is so critical in Islam because it actually defines the divine. That's why it's so critical. Because there is no mix between the creation and the divine. There's no sharing of attributes. There's no opposites to him and there's no uh, co-partners. And that's very profound because it dictates what we do as people of worship. For instance, in Islam we believe that we must worship God within his oneness, via his oneness, which means we single him out solely for worship. Which means he's the only one that has a right to be worshipped. The only one that is worthy of worship. This means that whatever God is in His oneness cannot be attributed to the created world. Because that would be a polytheistic creed. Secondly, what we do, we single Him out for help and assistance. And also we single Him out and we see within His oneness His names and attributes. So when He defines Himself as the just, as the loving, God describes Himself as Al-Wudud, which means the excessively lo loving. If that is the case, we appreciate a sense of what that means but we don't really know because we see it via the oneness of God which means He's distinct from creation There is nothing like Him He is different, transcendent from creation So, also what we do, we also Yeah, that's it really <laughs> Yeah, so oneness of God is, is extremely important um, because it's a very empowering philosophy as well. Because what do Muslims say? We say, There is no true power apart from the power of God. This is realizing oneness here. Now, if you're an atheist, for example, you're a materialist or you're a naturalist, or whatever you want to define yourself as, that the only thing that exists in the material world, that's a disempowering position. Because you believe that the only power is by cause and effect, is by the efficacy of the material world. And that's problematic because now you can start blaming your next door neighbor for not allowing you to sleep. Or you can start blaming Fox News for not allowing you to do what you want to do. Or you can start blaming the Zionists for not allowing you to become who you want to become as a nation. Do you see? You actually put sole blame to these things. But a Muslim who believes in the oneness of God and all true power belongs us to God, then these things we understand are just manifestations of God's will. So they don't have any true intrinsic power. The intrinsic power belongs to God. This is why we don't really believe the material world has any effect on how, what we're going to do in reality. This is why the Prophet ﷺ taught us, if the whole world was to gather against you and want harm for you, they would never harm you unless God wills it. And if the whole world were to gather against you to give you some good, you would never get that good unless God wills it. Now the question we ask is, do you know God's will? No, I don't. So what does that do? It gives you a new realm of possibility to achieve what you want to achieve in life. Because you don't know God's will. And you know that the material world has no true power. How powerful would you feel if you really believe in this concept? You could take over the world, man. <laughs> Who feels empowered now? <laughs> anyway, thank you very much for listening. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Ashhadu wa la ilha anta wa astaghfirullah wa tubi laik. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Brother Hamza, for the lecture and very, very enjoyed and welcome to it, Alhamdulillah. And as a small purpose association, we would like to give you this. Yeah. Oh, thank you. And thank you very much, and teacher. Thank you. Please do learn when you go back. How are you? Nice and tight. I like it. <laughs> So just to remind everyone, tomorrow is day two of Islam Awareness Week. Uh, tomorrow's... Who wants my notes? I do. Shotgun. Thank you. The title is The Message. It will be at Student Center. If you guys would like some brochures uh, about Islam, they are on the back of the Do not conceal knowledge. Sunny, yeah. I know. Sunny, I know. Sunny, I know.